For ten thousand years, these mighty warriors have fought, bled, and died for a pantheon of dark gods. For ten thousand years, the worthy are granted gifts and boons, mutations and insight to better serve their chosen patron and its plans for the universe. These mighty warriors are the Chaos Space Marines of the Old Legions. Genetically engineered killing machines that stopped pretending to be anything more than what they truly are. Some have found freedom in their new servitude. Some find their new masters more agreeable than the old one. And some are just pulled into hell by circumstance. Whatever the reason, these legionaries are veterans of the longest of wars and have been given gifts by their ruinous patrons to bring death to the galaxy. In this video, I'll be going in depth on the Legionary Kill Team, the Chaos Space Marines themselves, and this team really captures the feel of playing genetically engineered murder machines that are both horrifying to behold and still martial in nature. Starting right away with the Marks of Chaos, as it's one of the very first things you see in the book, and the toughest decision to make on the team. The Mark of Corn lets you bonk something in combat with a critical hit even if you didn't actually roll any critical hits yourself. Being able to guarantee critical damage is a very strong ability in combat, usually guaranteeing yourself a one-tap safe melee kill. Next up is the Mark of Nurgle. I'm just going to come out and say it, it's hands down the best mark on this list. The other three marks are useful and can be absolutely the right choices in certain situations, but this mark will never let you down. It is the right choice in every situation. The mark itself is quite powerful. Being able to upgrade a normal save to a critical save is just, ooh, so good. Good. Anything short of AP2 is going to just bounce off your stinky boys. The third mark is the mark of Slanesh. Slanesh gives you a flat 1 inch boost to your movement characteristic. This may seem weak and certainly is less flashy than the two marks before it, but one extra inch is critical to be able to reach objectives and charges you have no business reaching. The fourth is the mark of Zinch. Zinch allows you to retain one shooting dice of 5 up as a critical hit. It's kinda swingy, but when it works, it works. Great for the heavy weapons on the team and the melter gun. The final mark is undivided. It's very boring, but very functional. Gives you balanced on your attack so long as you're within 6 inches of your target in both shooting and fighting. Great for your plasma pistol wielding leaders. Finally, this team is a special rule called Favored of the Dark Gods. This rule allows you to use one strategic ploy per turn for free as long as the ploy is aligned with the mark that is on the operative that has this ability. I'll explain more later, but suffice to say, if your favorite model has the mark of corn, so long as he's alive, you can do one corn strategic ploy per turn for free. Now that I'm talking about strategic ploys, let's just jump into those, shall we? The ploys are more interesting on this team than a lot of others, since there are so many. However, besides a couple of ploys, the rest only work on Chaos Marines with the correct mark. Let's start with the strategic ploys that work on everyone regardless of mark. Malicious Volleys. If you don't fight, you can shoot twice with bolt weapons. Includes bolt pistols, bolters, and heavy bolters. Good old bolter discipline. You know it, you love it. Hateful Assault is the opposite ploy. If you don't shoot, you can fight twice. Much harder to pull off because you need to multi-charge something to get it to work, but oh so devastating if you can. Next up are the corn aligned strategic ploys. Blood for the Blood God and Perpetual Aggression. Blood for the Blood God, I say that five times fast, is amazing. If you fight after charging, the first time you strike with a hit, deal one additional damage. That's a big deal, and I'll go over that in more detail when I cover the operatives later on. Just remember this one. Perpetual Aggression, besides sounding like a punk rock band name, is a neat ploy. After every fight, and I do mean every fight, whether you started it or your opponent started it, if your corn marine killed whatever it was fighting, it gets to make a free 3 inch move. If it can move into engagement range of another enemy, it must do that. Otherwise, it can move anywhere it wants. This is pure value when combined with Hateful Assault, because now you don't have to multi-charge your targets. You can safely fight them one at a time, as long as they're within a dash of each other. The Nurgle aligned strategic ploys, Mutagenic Flesh and Implacable, are just straight value. 
Mutagenic Flash reduces all normal damage taken from shooting and melee by 1 to a minimum of 2 damage. Flamers and las guns are unaffected by Mutagenic Flash, but they're already really bad, so whatever. However, this makes Bolters require 2 whole more dice to kill you in shooting from normal damage, and Missile Launchers can no longer kill with a critical and a normal hit. Fighting becomes so much safer, except against power weapons. This ploy is the best ploy on the team, hands down. The second Nurgle ploy is implacable, which makes it so that your Nurgle Marines do not suffer negative APL penalties, and any penalties they had at the beginning of the turn are just ignored. Your Nurgle Marines also ignore being injured, so full movement and ballistic skill for the turn, and do not worsen their ballistic skill when overwatching. Another amazing ploy. Two of the best ploys on the team, coupled with a mark that turns saves into crit saves, means Nurgle Marines are a nightmare to actually put down, and they can fully use both ploys all game. The Slanesh aligned strategic ploys, Graceful Killer and Delicious Agony are kind of a letdown if I'm gonna be honest. Graceful Killer adds 1 to the critical damage of Slanesh operatives. You'll notice that this is in fact worse than the corn ploy that just adds 1 damage to any strike, normal or critical, as long as you charged. Which you should be doing, it's not a useless ploy by any means. There are plenty of lethal 5-up options for melee attacks that could benefit from having plus 1 critical damage, but ultimately, it is a worse version of another ploy we already have. Delicious Agony is also a miss, as interesting as it is. When you fight something that is already injured, you can hit it twice instead of once, before it gets to fight back. Against 90% of the models in the game, this is entirely useless. Anything with 10 or less wounds will die in one hit to basically all of your melee operatives if they are injured. 11 and 12 wounds would need a crit most likely, but that is not super hard to do with our melee specialists. The only targets this is useful on are models with 13 or more wounds and, ironically, Nurgle legionaries because they reduce damage on your attacks. There are not a lot of teams with wound counts that high, but legionaries do have a fair amount of representation. The Zinch Alliance strategic ploys are what you would expect. Protected by Fate is a bit swingy for me, but if it pops off, it can be a huge reduction of damage. If you roll a critical save, you can turn a failed save into a success. With a 3 plus save, that's not super useful, but combined with the other Zinch ploy, Etheric Ward, it's actually very good. Etheric Ward just gives your Zinch aligned marines Zinch's patented 4 plus invulnerable save. There are a lot of strategic ploys and this team relies heavily on their strategic ploys to do the fun, cool, interesting things they do. You'll spend a lot of CP on strategic ploys during your game. Despite the glut of strategic ploys, there are only five tactical ploys, one for each mark and Veteran of the Long War, back from the compendium and just as good as ever. Veteran of the Long War lets you repeat a shooting or melee attack using all the conditions of the original attack, if your initial attack did no damage. This does work with grenades, even though they have limited, and it also means that if you did no damage with an overcharged plasma gun, then you would be shooting your overcharged plasma gun again, hopefully you rolled a lot of 2s instead of 1s. Likewise, if you did no damage in melee, it's very likely you just took a bunch of damage, so probably not ideal to repeat that fight action unless you have a guaranteed 1-tap. It's a great tactical ploy, but try not to forget it at crucial moments like I do. The corn tactical ploy, Unending Bloodshed, is a great screw you. If your corn marine dies while in combat, you can pop this ploy and fight with one dice on death. Since it is a combat, but only one dice, you either roll a critical hit, roll a normal hit, and strike as though it were a crit, or miss so you're guaranteed to retaliate with a critical hit if you hit. It is worth noting that you will still count as injured for that single dice combat, however, it's hilarious if it goes off. The Nurgle tactical ploy is an odd one. Use it during a Nurgle Marine's activation, and anyone within 3 inches of it loses 1 defense dice. Great to put it on a missile and throw it at the enemy lines. Watch as your stinky boy makes the enemy scatter like Pumbaa from the Lion King. You can also be cheeky, giving your gunner the blade equipment that increases critical damage to 5, and then running him up to give him basically an additional AP. The Slanesh tactical ploy, Captivating Aura, is an amazing objective control tool. During a Slanesh Marine's activation, you can turn it on and all enemies that are visible and within 3 inches of that Marine have their APL reduced by 1. Amazing if you can nab a bunch of enemies in one shot with it. Just really good if it gets you control of an objective near the end of a turn. 
The Zinch tactical ploy is a boring but good one. Use it at the start of a Zinch Marine's activation to give it plus one APL, making it four APL for the activation. Straightforward but incredibly effective for missions with lots of mission actions and enemies to kill. Now onto the models themselves. Let's start with the leader options. You've got the Chosen and the Champion. The very brief version of the next couple of minutes is that the Chosen is great for killing and the Champion is great for doing mission actions and only good for killing. I'll start with the Chosen as it is much more focused. The Chosen does one thing very well and that is killing things dead. He comes with a Demon Blade as his only melee option and frankly, no other option is needed. This guy is an absolute monster in melee with 5 attacks hitting on 2+, plus and lethal 5+, plus basically guarantees at least 1 7 damage crit, 8 damage with the correct marks and ploys. The best part about that is that after dealing critical damage, he heals at the end of the fight assuming he didn't die 2 wounds. The amount of sustain on this model, coupled with his extremely dangerous melee profile, makes him one of the most dangerous operatives in the game. And we haven't even talked about his shooting options yet. As dangerous as the Chosen is in melee, he is no slouch in shooting either. Hitting on three is like all Space Marines, he has the option of the Tainted Bolt Pistol, which is a bolt pistol with balanced, which is actually really good, or a Plasma Pistol. As good as the Tainted Bolt Pistol is, nothing beats a Plasma Pistol. You'll take the Plasma Pistol 99% of the time, but the Bolt Pistol does have its uses. Given his melee prowess, the Mark of Corn or Slanesh is a great mark to put on him. Mark of Corn doesn't actually really do anything for him, just insurance if you roll like crap, so while it is less efficient, it is still a good way to guarantee healing to Two wounds, while the Mark of Slanesh increases your charge distance, letting you threaten from farther away. Both marks have ploys that increase damage dealt, turning those crits from one-shotting guardsmen to one-shotting elves, which is a big deal. The Mark of Nurgle makes this guy unbelievably tanky. The Mark of Zinch only affects his ranged weapons, and being able to keep a single 5 plus as a crit is okay, but isn't going to really change a whole lot. Much more efficient on the Tainted Bolt Pistol because of Balanced. Mark Undivided is also quite good with the Plasma Pistol, allowing you a free reroll, which can really help to mitigate any ones you've rolled while supercharging. And it also works in melee. Having Balanced in melee with a melee weapon this deadly is just the bee's knees. The champion is the other leader option, and while not as deadly, is also no slouch in all aspects of dealing death. The champion has the same options for ranged weapons, and will choose the plasma pistol 99% of the time, but he hits on twos in shooting as well as melee. Champs spend more time on the range, so his shooting is better. However, the champ's melee weapon options are significantly more numerous. You've got the option for the standard fair of power weapon, power fist, and an upgraded chainsword that can parry critical hits with normal hits. That is actually a huge deal. Note that it does not bypass the brutal special rule. Still need critical hits to parry brutal hits. But with 5 attacks at 4-5 damage, the humble chainsword is still a powerful melee weapon. It just cannot hit the important 10 damage breakpoint of the power weapon. And in melee, killing in less hits is more important important than being able to parry better. 90% of the time anyway. If you want to choose one weapon and never think about it again, the power weapon is that choice. If you want to make multiple choices, the power fist is a good tech choice into 7 or even 8 wound models. With a critical hit and the right ploys and marks, you can one shot those weaker models in melee, preventing them from striking back at all. The only choice you'll basically never pick is the power maul. It does the same damage of a power weapon, but trades lethal 5 plus for stun, which isn't that good of a trade, honestly. Requiring a critical hit to get value out of your weapon is a bit too much of a gamble for me. The Mark situation is pretty much the same as a Chosen. Putting the Mark of Corn on a Power Fist Champion pretty much guarantees dead Guardsmen or dead Elves, while Slanesh on a Power Weapon Champ can rip through teams with its extended charge range and 7 damage crits. Perfect for taking out Intercessors that are not durable. The Mark of Nurgle makes it harder to kill, and Zeech makes his pistol shooting slightly better, same as the Chosen. Mark Undivided is the same benefit for the champ as the Chosen. No matter which leader you choose, they both have Favorite of the Dark Gods, and so long as they're alive, will allow you to get a free strategic ploy based on the mark they have. Next up is the Gunner, an absolute staple of any Legionary team. You will be bringing one of them because this is where your best range power comes from. The three options are Flamer, Meltagun, and Plasma Gun. I'll skip the preamble. You'll be bringing the Plasma Gun 99% of the time. It has unlimited range, which already beats the range restriction on the Melta and Flamer, does amazing damage beating out the Flamer, and you can give yourself AP2 by going hot, which you basically always should be doing ones be damned. Plasma Guns are in fact just too strong. They crowd out all the other options they're put with usually. 
if you put a plasma gun with the heavy weapons, then there would be a discussion about what weapon to pick in what situation. But since it's with the special weapons, it just wins. Melted Gun is very strong too, and still better than the Flamer, but it's not as versatile and useful as the Plasma Gun. Seriously, if you're playing competitively, take the Plasma Gun. I am one of the unluckiest people I know, and I still always take the Plasma Gun. I've only rolled three ones twice so far, and never four ones at once. Being a gunner, putting a mark of corn on it seems like a waste, but I say look again. With the malefic blade equipment and mark of corn, you can do guaranteed 8 damage in 2 hits. 9 with the plus 1 damage ploy up, making your gunner no slouch in melee either. Slanesh, with its plus 1 inch of movement, allows your gunner to hit firing angles it has no business touching, and can catch enemies off guard with that or make your paltry 6 inch range guns much more threatening. Possibly a 16 inch threat range on turn 1, 19 inch with the dash scouting option. You'll probably lose your gunner if you do that, but it is quite funny. Mark of Nurgle makes your gunner stick around longer and also makes them 100% efficient when injured and overwatching, meaning you can fully make use of your low numbers to punish someone for leaving you an overwatch target. Mark of Zinch is great for your gunners. Being able to retain a 5 plus as a crit makes the average damage of your attacks go up. Excellent on the melt gun with its 4 mortal wounds per crit. Finally, Undivided is not as useful since you need to be within 6 inches to get the full benefit. Great for the Flamer and melt gun but as we established, you'll be using the Plasma Gun 99% of the time. The Heavy Gunner is where the choices start to get interesting. Your first choice with choosing your Heavy Gunner is, are you even going to choose a Heavy Gunner for your team this game? Now you might be thinking, George, you absolute fool! Of course I need my biggest guns! Hear me out. What you get in ranged firepower, you trade movement and flexibility, and I think movement and flexibility is much more valuable when you're playing against teams that outnumber you. Generally, teams that outnumber you are rather weak individually, so none of your models should have a difficult time killing anything. So a heavy weapon may just be a bit of overkill, where the heavy gunner's shine is playing into other elite teams. Your three choices are the heavy bolter, missile launcher, and reaper chain cannon, which is just such a great name for a gun. The heavy bolter, despite the only weapon with heavy in its name, is the least heavy option here, in that if your game plan is to run a Nurgle bolter gun line to maximize usage of malicious volleys, you want the heavy bolter in those lists. Now here is where someone in the comments would point out, the heavy bolter does the best single target damage out of all the options here. And while that is true, that is only true while malicious volleys is up. You need to shoot twice with the heavy bolter for it to be the strongest option. The missile launcher is is my personal favorite heavy weapon. It has the flexibility for firing at single targets, doing the same damage as a power fist, but at range, or having a blast option to shoot at hordes. Additionally, with the help from an acolyte, you can make your missile launcher lethal 5 plus and no cover, so that AP1 flying power fist is very likely to just kill whatever it hits every time you fire the damn thing. Lastly, and certainly not leastly, is the wonderfully named Reaper Chain Cannon. Just so damn fun to say. The thing puts out a ton of dice with amazing crit damage, great for killing clowns just to overwhelm their defenses with pure weight of dice. Unfortunately, that is about the only thing it excels at. Sure, you could bring it into just about any matchup and it'll do fine, but the only real niche I can find for it is killing clowns dead. And honestly, that's a pretty solid niche if you ask me. As for marks, unlike the gunner, the mark of corn on the heavy gunner is probably a bad idea, since you just won't have the movement to really get up in your opponent's face, even if you put a blade on it. Similarly for Slanesh, dashes are not affected by your movement characteristic, and the suspensor system equipment has a hard limit of 6 inches so the extra inch of movement is just not useful. Nurgle is the first mark that really has use here. Being able to just be harder to kill and be 100% efficient even when injured and overwatching makes the heavy gunner from very deadly to hyper deadly. Zinch is also a really good mark since getting a crit with any of the weapon options is a huge step up in damage. The heavy bolter becomes AP1 with a single crit. The missile launcher and chain cannon critical damage is two higher than normal damage for the guns instead of one more damage like almost everything else. Undivided it is not a great mark for the heavy weapons because if you are within 6 inches of your target to benefit from it, something terribly wrong has happened. Now we come to the demon boy himself, the anointed. It is an absolute monster in 
close combat, able to punch above its weight, and it is a genetically modified superhuman in a tank's worth of armor. His whole gimmick is that he can unleash the demon at the start of any of his activations. Once you do so, you cannot put the genie back in the bottle. For the rest of the game, the anointed gains a 5-up feel no pain, its already good melee weapon becomes amazing, gaining ceaseless and lethal 5-up on top of rending, and it can fight twice without using hateful assault. You get all that for the low, low price of being mostly useless on the mission. Seriously, Demon Boy can't do any mission actions, can't overwatch, can't shoot his bolt pistol, and can't even pick anything up. And anything he does have picked up before he becomes a demon, he must drop in immediately once he does become a demon. Now, I recognize that sounds like giving up a lot, but I have come to give you the good gospel of who cares about the mission when I can just blenderize my opponent's team? Seriously, with a 5-up feel no pain, this guy can take incoming fire from a withering amount of sources, including multiple separate plasma gun attacks, even without the mark of Nurgle. Being able to fight twice means that any multi-charges are just plain value to you. And in missions where you don't need to push buttons, him not being able to push buttons isn't even an issue. The Anointed is great if you unleash the demon when he still has all of his wounds remaining. And generally, that means going spooky turn 1. If you're quite sure that Demon Boy won't get shot at turn 1, or turn 2 before he has a chance to activate, then you can spend turn 1 doing mission actions like any other legionary on the team. As soon as he takes some damage though, he becomes much less effective at his job of murdering things in melee and face tanking everything. In missions with lots of button pressing, it can be wise to leave this one on the bench. With the Mark of Corn, being able to utilize perpetual aggression means you don't even need to get multi-charges. Just ping pong from one enemy to the next. Mark of Slanesh lets you rush around and get longer charges, as well as turn your melee weapon into a rending, ceaseless power sword. Oh my. Mark of Nurgle makes the Demon Boy disgustingly resilient. See what I did there? But seriously, combined with the reduction in damage ploy, the free crit save, and the feel no pain, he's better than a Death Guard Marine at staying alive. And faster, too. The Mark of Zinch is entirely wasted on this guy, since it only works on shooting attacks. However, the ability to give him Zinch's patented and vulnerable save can be useful. The Undivided Mark is the least useful mark, because he cannot benefit from any God Marks or Bolter Discipline, and having balanced in melee is nice, but he already has Ceaseless. Definitely stay away from Undivided on Demon Boy if you're playing competitively. Now we come to our favorite local meat man, the Butcher. I like this guy. He stocks all the best cuts of meat, from beef to pork, even some hard to find meats like duck. What? Not that kind of Butcher? What other kind of Butcher is there? Ah, dark. Sorry about that. The Legionary Butcher does not stock all the best cuts of meat, but does know all the best cuts. Like all the other melee specialists, he comes standard with a bolt pistol, as well as his massive chain axe. What this guy does that the rest of the specialists don't do is control space with that massive weapon. Whenever the Butcher fights in combat, enemies cannot get combat support, so even if he is literally surrounded on all sides by enemies, they never increase their weapon skill to hit him. Additionally, his engagement range is one extra inch wide, so enemies within two inches of him cannot move or dash, but must fall back or charge. Great for holding a bunch of weak models in place that are grouped up or holding a choke point so no one can get past you. Finally, his weapon itself is actually a little meh. It is a power fist that trades Brutal for Reap 2, and I personally would rather have Brutal. Reap helps the Butcher in his preferred job of charging multiple enemies at once, but that is a lot easier said than done ever. Additionally, it hits on 4s instead of 3s, making it a lot less consistent. This is mitigated by a couple of rules. If the Butcher is the attacker in the fight, he gets ceaseless. Rerolling 1s is better than nothing, but on a 4+, plus, that's still not that great. And if the Butcher charged during his activation, then the weapon gains a Relentless, which is much better. That does mean, if the Butcher was charged, it is a very inefficient melee operative. My favorite mark to put on this guy is Corn, because who can pass up a guaranteed 7 damage? That will kill a whole lot of models in the game in one hit. With the Corn ploy that increases damage on the first hit, 
now you deal 8 damage, and that kills all the Eldar teams in one hit as well. Frankly, this is really the only way I use this model, as his need to get the charge and fairly swingy hit rate makes it more of a gamble than I'd like. Not that it's the only way, mind. With the Mark of Slanesh, it becomes far less of a gamble on whether or not you'll get the charge off, because you'll have extra charge distance on your enemy. You can still do 8 damage crits, and with Relentless you can do a bit of crit fishing to try and get those one tap opportunities, but it's less guaranteed because the Butcher has one less attack than every other melee operative on the team at a paltry 4 attacks. Mark of Nurgle makes him harder to kill, but doesn't make him better at his job, so I generally don't take him in Nurgle teams, and Zinch only really affects his bolt pistol, and the ploys don't particularly elevate him in any meaningful way either. Undivided is useful on the Butcher, having balanced gives some insurance against getting charged, as well as some help when you fight without charging, but you should really be focused on being the one charging with the Butcher 100% of the time, so it shores up a weakness of the model, rather than elevating a strength, decent for learning how to Butcher with the Butcher. The Shry of Talon is our debuff specialist. With the least impressive weapon spread on the team, it is still a competent fighter, and its paltry normal damage should not throw you off from picking him. Equipped with a bolt pistol like all the other melee specialists, his melee weapon is the Flensing Blades. 5 attacks doing 3-5 damage, like the Malefic Blade equipment. However, unlike the equipment, he gets Lethal 5 Plus built in, making him much more deadly. Easily able to deal with 8 wound teams, and surprisingly good at 10 wound teams, he can hold his own, though rarely without taking some hits back in retaliation. This is mitigated somewhat by him always attacking first. His biggest ability is that if he is in combat as the defender, he just goes before the attacker, guaranteeing that the Shrive Talon always strikes first. That's a big deal with a weapon damage profile as relatively poor as his for a melee weapon. Additionally, whenever he kills something in melee, you can choose one model within 3 inches of him to reduce their APL by 1. Being able to ping pong a corn Shrive Talon from a kill into an enemy that no longer has the APL to fall back is a very interesting strategy. He also has a unique action to drop a grizzly mark, which makes doing mission actions and picking things up harder if the enemy model doing those actions is within 3 inches of the mark itself, as well as making controlling objectives tougher. Unfortunately, that action costs 2 AP to do, so it is not an insignificant investment of resources. The Shrive Talon trades some outright melee lethality for a touch of debuff power, and I think requires the most finesse of any operative on the team to get the most out of him. I probably would not take him into Space Marines, however, as his low damage profile means he cannot kill a full health space marine in two hits. The mark of corn on this guy, as stated before, is mostly about using the ploys on him, especially perpetual aggression. With lethal 5 plus, the odds of not rolling any critical hits is very unlikely, so the mark ability is just insurance against a poor roll. The mark of slanesh is where this guy gets very interesting. The extra movement, like in all the other cases thus far, opens up more opportunities for controlling space and making charges, as well as the ploy that increases critical damage by 1, means that he is now a very credible threat to space marines, even Nurgle legionaries. Mark of Nurgle makes him very difficult to kill from taking those slaps back in melee, giving him much more sustain, and being able to really specialize into that debuff role with the Nurgle tactical ploy, making your ranged threats even more deadly to the enemies around him. The Mark of Zinch makes his bolt pistol slightly more likely to crit, which is eh, but crucially, the tactical ploy that gives him an additional APL makes doing his unique action much easier. The Mark Undivided gives him balanced with his pistol and melee, which is actually a great benefit for this model, though I'm not sure it's worth giving up the other abilities and access to the ploys other marks can benefit from. I'm supposed to talk about the Icon Bearer now, but the Icon Bearer and the Warrior are the same models, except for a couple of extra benefits on the Icon Bearer. So, everything I say here can be applied to the Legionary Warrior, except for the special abilities. Without further ado, you've got two options for Warriors and Icon Bearers, Melee or Ranged. Melee Warriors have a Bolt Pistol and a Chainsword. They are shockingly effective at what they do. Five attacks dealing 4-5 damage in Melee will put a hurting or a killing on just about everything in the game that isn't Grey Knights. For the ranged option, you get a Bolter and Fists. 
Pound for pound, this is the worst option of the two without any equipment. You do 4 attacks, 3-4 damage in both shooting and melee, which is only okay. However, with the tainted rounds equipment, you can up your bolter damage to 4-5, effectively turning your bolter warrior or icon bearer into another gunner. It is very effective to add a bit more ranged punch to the team. So now that we know the two standard options for warriors and icon bearers, let's talk about what the icon bearer gets over the warrior. First thing, and most importantly, Icon bearers are favored of the dark gods, like your leader, so as long as they're alive, you can get a free strategic ploy based on the mark they have. No, you cannot get two free ploys per turn. If your leader and icon bearer have different marks, you get to choose which strategic ploy from which god you get for free. If they have the same mark, you only get one strategic ploy for free, not both of the god's ploys. However, having both be the same mark gives you some redundancy in case one of them dies early on. You can still get free ploys if the other is alive. Less crucially, but still quite crucial, is that the Icon Bearer counts for one extra APL when controlling objectives, so it can steal objectives from other Space Marines. Doesn't come up a lot, but when it does, it is usually to do something like win the game. You know, nothing important or anything. So, now that you know what an Icon Bearer does, you should know you will never take Warriors. We have so many specialists on the team that you'll only have one Warrior slot, and in that case, just take the Icon Bearer because it's a Warrior Plus. Generally speaking, for the melee Icon Bearer slash Warriors, you're going to want to focus with the Mark of Korn or Slanesh for all the reasons of the other melee specialists. Nurgle is a good all-around mark, and Zinch is good for your ranged Icon Bearer. Undivided is just okay for both. When choosing your mark for the Icon Bearer, you also have to take into account the Favorite of the Dark Gods ability, and really try to nail down what free ploys you want to be able to have. Do you take a different mark from your leader for more flexibility, or do you take the same mark for more redundancy, in case one of them dies early? That's something for the strategy you want to do with the team as a whole, and I'll get into team strategies later. Lastly, the Balefire Acolyte. This guy is an interesting operative. He's got the Tainted Bolt Pistol, only seen on the leader outside of the Acolyte, which is a Bolt Pistol with balance, so it's not bad. As well as a melee weapon that deals two mortal wounds when retaining crits, like a sniper or meltagun, just for punching, or I guess, stabbing in this case. But the melee weapon does rather poor melee damage, all things considered. But uh, enough about the weapons. The Acolyte is a mini sorcerer. We've got psychic powers, baby! Woo! I really like the psychic powers available to this team. Two of them are pretty solid shooting attacks, and one is an incredible buff. The most popular of the powers is Fire Blast. This ain't your third level fireball spell from Dungeons and Dragons. This thing can pack a wallop. Dealing bolter damage standard, what sets it apart is that it is a blast weapon, normal 2 inch blast radius, that also has no cover, so anyone you do shoot it at will never benefit from cover saves, as well as having Splash 2. So each crit deals two mortal wounds to the target and anyone in blast range of the person actively being shot. I think you know where this is going. Drop it on a cluster of dudes and watch as the damage racks up. Unless you're as unlucky as I am, but most people aren't. Normally when someone says, the more enemies you can hit with a blast weapon the better, it just seems like common sense. But in this case, it has almost a multiplicative effect on the damage with all the possible splash damage. In fact, the splash damage goes out even farther than the blast, since every enemy hit in the blast will splash out two inches from them, so even enemies not caught in the blast can still take some damage. It's very good. And the mainstay shooting attack for the Acolyte. The next shooting attack is also the healing power. Five attacks, three three damage hitting on threes is actually really good. It's a great way to guarantee three or six damage on something that is super low but needs to die right now. The best part being, so long as you do at least 6 damage, you can choose someone within 6 inches of the target to heal. Yeah, it's only D3 instead of 2D3 like other medic abilities, but other medic abilities don't kill models as part of the healing. Finally, the last psychic power might be the single best buffing spell in the game. It gives all the weapons a friendly model that is visible to the acolyte, lethal 5 up, no cover, and brutal. That is, well, brutal. Now, you may be thinking, man, Fire Blast with lethal 5 plus would be devastating! Slow your roll. Psychic shooting attacks are not equipped weapons, so they are not able to get buffed. The upside to that is that psychic shooting attacks are never affected by being injured either. So blast away with however many wounds you have left, Nurgle ploy be damned. But it can do other things. 
Have you ever considered buffing himself than wading into combat? With lethal 5 plus and 5 attacks, that should average out to about 2 critical hits or so in melee, which means you deal 4 damage to your target before even striking the first blow. And they need criticals to parry even your normal hits. Or how about buffing your missile launcher? Now suddenly that ranged power fist crits on 5s and they can't take cover saves and it's already AP1. Point at Marine. Marine is now dead. In fact, for the same reason the Zinch mark is so good for the heavy guns, buffing your heavy guns with the Acolyte is a force multiplier on any of your heavy weapons. Same thing for the Melta Gun if you're running that, but we've covered why you're probably not running that. Now, as for marks, this guy literally cannot take the Mark of Corn. Corn hates magic and the pansies that wield it. Mark of Slanesh is pretty amazing on the Acolyte. Being able to move farther means you get better fire blasts or into position to buff someone who was previously thought to be out of visibility. Mark of Nurgle is also great. Helps keep your Acolyte alive and once you make a lethal 5 plus missile launcher the first time, your opponent is going to want to do everything in their power to prevent that from ever happening again. Mark of Zine is a staple and its ability works on every shooting attack not an equipped weapon so it makes fire blast that much deadlier by being able to retain one five as a crit to proc that sweet sweet splash damage undivided is also fine getting two rerolls when shooting with the pistol is very good though it is only a bolt pistol and getting a reroll in melee is pretty good especially if you've buffed yourself and want to do some crit fishing let's get more in depth with the equipment now that i've touched on them a bit with the models the equipment selection on this team is interesting. Honestly, it's a mixed bag. Some of it is really good, some of it is borderline pointless. Let's start at the top. Aggression stimulants are, well, why are they even here? Giving balanced only after charging for a massive three equipment points and limited to one? Don't worry, GW, I wasn't planning on taking it at all. The models that can benefit most from this either already get full or partial rerolls built in, or have that weakness short over by choosing the Mark of Corn. This is a baffling piece of equipment. It's not useless. Balanced is still balanced after all, but it's overcosted for what it provides. If it were not limited to one, three equipment points sounds more reasonable to me. But with it being limited and being expensive, it's not worth it over all the other expensive equipment the team has. Next up is the grenades. They're frag and crack grenades. They're good. After the grenades is another baffling inclusion, the worded armor. Again, maximum one of these on the team and expensive at three equipment points. You'll notice a theme here in a minute. It makes whoever has it have a two plus save until they take damage. Why the qualifier? As soon as they get hit with any weapon with AP1 or better, you no longer have a two plus save. In fact, as soon as you get into melee, you're going right back to a three plus save. I understand why this is limited to one maximum, and I understand understand why it does not cost two equipment points. That would be too cheap. But three pushes this over the edge for me. There are better things to spend our equipment points on, and they also cost three equipment points. Suspenser system, absolutely mandatory if you are taking a heavy gunner. Gives them cumbersome instead of heavy, allowing you to move a max of six inches during a turn and still fire your heavy weapon. Costs three equipment points. Malign scriptures, just, ugh, I don't like this piece of equipment. Not that it's useless. Seems that I say that a lot for this team, don't I? For two equipment points, you get to gamble on whether your sorcerer can cast two powers in one turn or waste one action point and take three mortal wounds. I have notoriously terrible luck, so I am slightly biased here. Considering you need to roll a three plus to not waste an action and hurt yourself doing it, which isn't really all that terrible, but eventually it will fail you and when you are burned by the scriptures, it's hard to go back to using it. Tinted Rounds, our first real winner besides the grenades. Three equipment point and maximum of one increases the damage and critical damage of a bolter or bolt pistol, including the Acolyte's special bolt pistol, by one. Turns whatever is equipped with it into a Pathfinder with more wounds and better armor. An absolute must take in 99% of matches. Grizzly Trophy, back at it from the compendium and boy am I glad to see it. Maximum one on the team and three equipment points. Did say legionary equipment was expensive, right? Any model within three inches of the bearer has their ranged and melee number of attacks reduced by one. Not their skill, they don't hit worse. They get one whole dice less on the attack. It's very good. I almost never leave home without it. Almost. This is usually in contention with a grenade for me. Finally, Malefic Blade. Increase the number of attacks and critical damage of fists by one, making even your gunners actually dangerous in melee. Efficiently costed a two equipment point, you'll probably take one, just because you'll have two equipment point left over from all the other expensive equipment you have to buy on this team. 
On to the tack ops. This team's tack ops are, frankly, challenging to score. Very fluffy, but ultimately quite difficult. Now, that puts this team's tack ops in the same company as just about every other specialist team in the game, so it's not surprising they're difficult to score. Let's start with Sacrilegious Mutilation. You reveal it the first time you kill an enemy, and on that enemy and every enemy you kill until the game is over, you drop a corpse token. Then you have to do a 1 AP mission action to defile the corpse token, removing it from the kill zone. Once you do that twice, you score one victory point. Doing it four times gives you the second victory point. This is actually surprisingly tough to do, unless the enemy team is going to run at you like Blooded or Hive Fleet. Even then, they can overwhelm a couple of marines, making it so that you have to hustle Gunner from the back to the battle line to do those mission actions to score you points. This tack up almost requires the entire team to be moving upfield so that when someone gets a kill, their buddy can score you points. Dark Desecration is also another interesting but challenging tack up. Reveal it in turn 1 and choose a piece of heavy terrain, like seize ground from the security archetype as you do. You must kill at least 2 enemies that are within 1 inch of that heavy terrain to score your first victory point. Then also control that terrain at the end of the game to score your second. It's worth noting that if you don't kill enough enemies within 1 inch of it, you can't score the second victory point. Can be challenging to do, but it pairs very well with central control and seize ground. Finally, Savage Butcher. This tack op is very interesting. Great on corn or slanesh operatives. When you reveal it on any turn, you choose one marine. As long as that marine kills at least two enemies in melee, you score one victory point. If that marine kills three enemies in melee, you score your second victory point. This sounds fine, until you realize you have to reveal it in order to start counting the kills. So you have to nominate your butcher before the butchering starts. If he whiffs, then that's probably zero points on this tack op. If you reveal too early, you could get your butcher shot off the board before the butchering and now zero points. There are a lot of things that can go so very wrong with this tack up. It is worth noting that your butcher does not have to survive, just get a bunch of melee kills before he dies. Ultimately, this team will rely on the archetypes it has access to rather than the faction tack ops to score most of its secondaries. The faction tack ops are all still better than the worst of the normal tack ops in each archetype. What this team lacks in tack ops, it makes up for in sheer versatility. There's really only one tactic that I know of for this team, and that is Nurgle Bolter Spam. The idea is to rely on your resilience and take as many bolters, bolt pistols, and the heavy bolter as possible, and make full use of malicious volleys and full ballistic skill overwatches to overwhelm low wound count teams with weight of fire. Basically the same strategy as Intercession Squad in those matchups. Outside of that particular strategy, the best strategy I can think of is knowing your enemy and your team. For example, splashing a corn chosen and or butcher to guarantee 8 damage against corsairs or void dancers. You'll have to recognize what weaknesses you can lean on to fold the enemy team, whether that's strong melee or strong shooting. Legionaries can do both very well and have the marks to support both styles in one roster. Unlike some teams, legionaries require some time investment from you to learn them to fully take advantage of what they can bring to the table. Or you can just go full Nurgle and take whatever operatives you want. That works too. I hope this video has been helpful to better understand what this powerhouse of a team can do, and how it is much more flexible and tactical than it first appears. The strength of the legionary team is in its versatility just as much as it is in the strength of the individual models. Okay audience, I have something serious to talk about now. I want to make more of these videos more often, but to do that I need more time to actually play the game. Learning a team well enough to give you all pointers and tactics and breakdowns of the individual models takes a fair number of games, and it's difficult to get those games played in a reasonable amount of time. That's where you guys can come in. If you like these videos and want to see more, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, because I will likely never actually see any revenue from these videos with the way that YouTube is monetized. They simply do not come out fast enough. Don't worry, I will still be making these videos and sharing them with you all. Supporting me only allows me to make these videos faster. If every person who watched this video or my last few videos supported me with just $1 a month, I could literally quit my full-time job and put out these videos and have the time to actually edit some battle reports and make even more content. Link to my Patreon is in the description of the video. Every little bit helps. You'll also get some more perks, like access to the homebrew kill teams I made in one easy-to-find space, as well as access to some tabletop RPGs I've designed myself. Thanks for all the support and just watching the videos in the first place. May the Dark Gods bless you. Do you hear the voices too?